So they're gonna hire the firm that they think is the biggest, the baddest, and the best. So you got to be big, and the clients gotta think that you're the biggest and the best. To look the baddest and the best, you gotta go big. Omnichannel marketing will help you get there. If you're not evolving as a lawyer in a super competitive space like personal injury in a city like LA, I mean, some young kid is gonna come and take over. You're listening to Personal Injury Mastermind, where we give you the tools you need to take your personal injury practice to the next level. West Coast Trial Lawyers is one of the largest firms growing in California. With 15 offices, over 20 attorneys, and over 100 staff, they show no signs of stopping. President of West Coast Trial Lawyers, Nima Romani, is a wealth of information, and his track record is impressive. He's handled thousands of cases, resulting in seven and eight-figure settlements and judgments, and has helped his clients win more than $1 billion. Today, I caught up with him for a second interview to get into one of my favorite subjects, marketing. Three in-house marketing teams at West Coast drive awareness and growth, paid SEO and social. We get into how each team plugs into the vision and goals of the business, how the firm has evolved, the importance of intake, and why hiring non-revenue generating positions will accelerate your growth. I'm your host, Chris Dreyer, founder and CEO of Rankings.io. We help elite personal injury attorneys dominate first page rankings with search engine optimization. Being at the forefront of marketing is all about understanding people. So let's get to know our guest. Here's Nima Romani, president at West Coast Trial Lawyers on his philosophy and how it's changed since we last spoke. You know, we're doing a little bit more of a shotgun approach. Digital will always be king. No one's going to dethrone Google. But obviously, social media has changed since we last spoke. You know, so we're doing a lot more TikToks, for instance. And as far as some of the traditional marketing, we're able to be a little bit more focused, right? You know, there's your traditional radio. But now with Spotify and Pandora, you can target people or even, you know, whether it's Hulu or some other kind of TV platforms, you can actually target people in a much more focused way on some of the older traditional forms of advertising than you could previously if you're just advertising on cable TV. So we are doing some of that. Places that we are running a lot of Google ads, for instance, we will put up billboards as well. So, you know, again, not so much of a, you know, kind of a a traditional play, but we are adding some of those traditional forms of advertising on top of our digital. Yeah. And I, I got to applaud you from like the Spotify and some of these other channels I just, I feel like it's not talked about. It's like one of those things. So there's not as much competition. So you can get those, those low cost per thousand impressions compared to like, you know, where everyone goes and where attention goes and everyone starts advertising all the costs just jump up. Oh yeah. The CPM is great on some of those. So I kind of encourage folks to get in there. You know me, like uh, for me, I don't want to hold it to myself. I want customers to make the best decision. Obviously I think I bring some things to the table that a lot of personal injury firms don't. So I'd rather have higher quality competition in there than some of these folks that really, you know, I mean, they're lawyers, but they're not really in the practice of law. They're in the business of law. So yeah, trying to trying to just get as many cases as possible, burn through them and and maybe not work up the cases in the same. Yeah. One of the reasons why I wanted to have you back on, it's kind of self-serving, but also, you know, I, I love speaking to you. You're always very willing to share is you guys are crushing social media with your video marketing specifically. I love the like green screen, the the different transitions that you're doing. So the first thing I got to ask though is, you know, how do you know it's working? Because the attribution's murky and, you know, how does it translate into your overall goals for the business? I know it's working because, you know, obviously, you know, we use all the same kind of call metrics and tracking that everyone else does, but we also ask people and people stop me all the time. I mean, all over the world, right? I'm traveling with my wife. People, hey, man, I saw your TikTok or what's going on with Johnny Depp. You know, we try to make law interesting because, listen, fundamentally, I don't care if it's personal injury law or SEO, unless you're a legal nerd or you're a technical guy or girl, this isn't, you know, pop culture. So we're really trying to introduce you know, pop culture and law. And again, there's some cases that kind of bring it all together because I'm doing so much PR work and legal commentary. I try to bring that in, you know, whether it's for an SEO link or someone to say, hey, I saw this guy on TV. I saw him in print. I want to hire him as opposed to all these other lawyers out there. 
I get sucked into TikTok and, you know, I saw you covering Johnny Depp and I saw some of your material myself. So I wanted to ask, you know, is, is it part of the the strategy is you got to have some of that entertainment type stuff, the trending stuff. Otherwise, you know, maybe you're just not going to create a following. Is that like one of the key components that really makes it work? I think so. Obviously, the impressions on TikTok are through the roof, right? It's blowing Instagram out of the water. I don't care if it's IG reels, posts, stories, whatever the case may be. If something new pops up and you want to be in the space, you got to hop on it. Look, it might be something like a clubhouse ends up fizzling out or a TikTok that ends up kind of taking over. But, you know, I always say law is not sexy. It's not interesting. An example I give is, you know, you're on Instagram, you're kind of scrolling through and, you know, if you're a plastic surgeon or a dermatologist, you're talking about fillers, Botox, whatever, everyone's all about it. But we're in the business of like catastrophic injuries. We're like a orthopedic spine surgeon you know no one wants to see that or think about that so you gotta make what you're doing interesting because fundamentally it's not sports it's not music it's not fashion so that's something that we try to do notwithstanding the not interesting subject matter of what we're dealing with and you showcase your expertise when you're on in front of the media and you get some of those clips kind of mixed in with the entertainment side and you just speaking about the trending topics really helps out too the other thing, just TikTok in general that I found is, you know, I think early on the ad spend, right? And and we're really new to the game. Like we're not near as advanced. So do you think that, you know, putting some ad dollars behind it to kind of get some additional reach? Or do you think it's still, hey, organic all day, just create good viral content? Like what's kind of your philosophy on that? Yeah, it really depends, right? I mean, again, one of the things... The luxury I have is I do court TV, I do long crime almost every day. So I can easily, they're covering these cases. I just then I'll shoot a couple TikToks or YouTube shorts or IG Reels or whatever the case may be. And we got a good team here and they just edit it and make it look great. You know, it really depends on the platform. I mean, the problem with TikTok right now, if you're running ads, it doesn't go to your page, right? It's kind of its own ad, has its own comments. So whereas if you're talking about targeting, right? Maybe because you got no privacy. Facebook is probably the best, right? I mean, you're talking about only people's parents using Facebook, but if you want to get to your target audience, whatever it is, could be e-commerce, could be you know your, your service industry like law, that's going to be the best of all the kind of big social media platforms. But I mean, who's using Facebook anymore? I think TikTok's going to evolve over time and just like anything else, it's probably going to sell out, right? You know, like, like, like most of these companies ultimately do, you know? It could be Yelp that was kind of all about reviews. Now they're running like 10 ads before the organic. Ultimately, things will change over time. And I think TikTok will start to want to monetize more. These startups are always in growth mode at the beginning. They want to be cool. They don't want to bombard people with advertising because they just want to get the largest reach possible. Once they have that captive audience, then I'm sure the ad dollars will be you know targeted towards individuals. And then people will get pissed off and they'll go to the next big thing. Like that's the trajectory, right? You have all this organic content viral. They they create this community where everyone congregates and then they make it pay to play. We saw that with Facebook. We saw it with Instagram where you could get some organic reach, but now it's like, hey, you got to put ad dollars behind it. The, the interesting thing, have you kind of looked at, it's interesting to see, and I wanted to get your thoughts on like YouTube shorts trying to compete with TikTok because YouTube's, you know, a behemoth. What have you seen, and, and you kind of alluded that TikTok's blowing reels out of the water, but what have you seen TikTok kind of versus YouTube shorts? Yeah, I mean, YouTube has its own thing. Like, So we'll do long form on YouTube, you know, which obviously doesn't work. It'll be interesting to see, because also YouTube has YouTube kids, right? So I got kids, um, and kids right now, and, and obviously that, that's what everyone wants, right? Not kids, but really young adults. We're like way too old for, you know, anyone to be really targeting us, because you, you get younger people hooked in, and then they're hooked. So I think YouTube has a huge advantage that Meta doesn't, because Facebook and Instagram, I mean, they, they just haven't grown and evolved. But YouTube... Because it has YouTube kids and you, you got these content creators on YouTube. I think YouTube's probably the only one. Obviously, you got Google behind it, right? That's really in a position to compete with TikTok. I don't think they're there yet in terms of the YouTube shorts. But, I mean, we pump them out. And I think if anyone has a chance to kind of even match TikTok, it will be YouTube. I don't think it's going to be meta. Gary Vee, you know, he made this post about three years ago and he had, you know, 64 pieces of content a day. And then he started talking about LinkedIn organic and everybody went to LinkedIn organic and started doing a lot of LinkedIn stuff. And now today he's just talking about TikTok. If you got any time, he's like, do tick four TikToks a day. There's got to be a little strategy because I take some of our podcasts and I try to put them on there and it's just, it's not platform correct. And it just doesn't do as well as like making content specifically for TikTok. 
Yeah, I mean, it really depends, right? Obviously, I'm on LinkedIn. You know, if it's something nerdy, if I'm in, you know, and I say it respectfully, I mean, like, I do everything. I do, like, TMZ. I do Us Weekly. I do their legal show every single week. You know, that just lands me more interesting, you know, if that content goes on TikTok. If it's going to be, like, I'm talking about Trump, and I'm talking to Newsweek or CNN or whatever, I mean, that's going to be LinkedIn. You really got to kind of know your audience, know who you're marketing to. And, you know, some people want it really dumbed down because TikTok, man, if you don't get them in the first, like, two to three seconds, they're gone. We're talking about, like, really short, you know, whereas, like, obviously LinkedIn, even YouTube, you know, you're going to have that longer form. People are going to be kind of more patient, much smaller audience, but going to be, you know, I say this respect for a little bit more sophisticated, going to be more willing to get into the legal weeds or whatever you want to talk about, whereas TikTok, man, they're just not. You know, being an avid TikTok user myself, and I got to applaud their algorithm because it's interspace. So as soon as I start engaging on like real estate investing or entrepreneur stuff or motivation, like that's what I'm seeing. And, I, and that's why I like it compared to like Instagram, where some of my friends, e- even though they're my friends or, or even an entrepreneur, they may post stuff that I just don't care about. And so the one thing that I notice though, is like when I see a video, the first thing I do is I look to see how many likes it has. And like, if it doesn't have very many, I'm like scrolling by. So right there's your two second thing. So do you think that engagement pods are going to be a thing on TikTok, just like they are on LinkedIn, just like they are on Instagram, where people are artificially pumping these to get, to get a little more visibility? Yeah, of course, whether it's a blue check mark or likes, people that got in early, they're going to have a huge advantage, right? They got that following. So those attorneys, that and look, we're late to the game. Maybe we're you know six months or you know certainly no more than twelve months late. But there are attorneys that got in right away. They got big engagements. They got big following. So for me to catch up, I gotta bang out great content, you know. And we we've been able to grow much faster in, in TikTok than other social media platforms because I think we're trying to do a good job. I got the team, but again, those folks that got in early, you got that core group, you got the verification, and you're a known commodity. Everyone else, the public's going to perceive as, listen, man, you're just copying, you know, him or her. So it is tough to play catch up, but I would still encourage folks to get in because the barrier to entry in TikTok is still a lot lower than it is on Instagram. Nima recently wrote a book, Harvard to Hashtag, which is packed with amazing tips and strategies and insights. A link to the book is found in the show notes. Here's how it came about middle of a pandemic, I was actually doing an interview with uh, Nancy Grace. I think it was on George Floyd or Kyle Rittenhouse. And we're doing a commercial and she's like, hey, man, you've done all sorts of crazy things. You went to Harvard Law School. You worked at like the largest law firms in the country. You're a prosecutor for many years. Now you got your own firm. You're doing PI. You should write a book. And I'm like, you know what? I will write a book. Listen, I've transitioned from, you know, as big firm lawyer, you know, federal prosecutor, handling the cartels, corrupt politicians. Now I'm like learning, you know, SEO and social media trends. So it kind of talks about my journey. But a lot of what we talk about here today, I mean, that hashtag part, if you're not evolving as a lawyer in a super competitive space like personal injury in a city like L.A., I mean, some young kid is going to come and take over. So you got to be cutting edge and you got to be open. Again, obviously, you and your team, you're always in the forefront of technology and trends and social media. But a lot of lawyers aren't. They're dinosaurs, right? You know, they're still dealing with boxes of, you know, paper documents. So um, I kind of encourage everyone, listen to the podcast, make sure you know what's coming and you really want to kind of be ahead of the curve. It'll make your job that much easier. So what's like the the TLD, like kind of summary of what's in the book? Yeah, 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 exactly. The TLD is this. Is if you're a lawyer, look, a lot of them are kind of stuck in this sort of prestige vibe, right? You know, look, TikTok is beneath me. I'm not going to be on there dancing and, you know, giving away advice for free and, you know, talking to like high school kids or you, know, you got to set that aside. If you're committed to marketing, This is something that you got to do because people are cutting the cord. They're always on their phone. It's taken over. So that's basically the bottom line lesson. And something that was really even kind of difficult for me to learn. And I want to make sure that everyone, you know, gets there faster and doesn't make some of the same mistakes that a lot of other lawyers are making. 100% of the proceeds go to charity. So it's not even like a moneymaker for me. I'm donating all the foster kids. So from what you do on the digital standpoint, it's so much, it's so much more advanced than most firms. Like we met, you know, several years ago at an AVO convention and we were talking about SEO and deep strategies there. 
and you're talking about Yelp strategies and and social media and you're on the cutting edge, you're like first in, like really, you know, hitting TikTok, you know, so, but a lot of people, it, it seems overwhelming and on the social side, just from my point of view, and it's very difficult to use like a strategic partner on the social side because of the content requirements. So, you know, what does the team composition look like? How, how what What's your approach when you're thinking about topics and putting together this amazing social media content that you do? Yeah, so we got three teams here and we have about like, you know, anywhere usually from a dozen to 15 people in-house that are working on this, setting aside kind of any agencies we're working with. We got like PR teams and publicists and all that, but let me tell you about our in-house team. We have our SEO team and um, you know a lot of those folks, right? They're doing your typical SEO stuff. We got our paid team, right? Whether it's Google ads or any type of paid ads. I mean, they're, they're doing all that. They're in the dashboard and looking for analytics, running A-B testing, but you gotta have your social team, you know? And these are folks that live and breathe social media. So when you're, you know, interviewing your hire, you want people that like Snapchat their food and like, you know, are just always on it because that's what you need. And as a lawyer, you gotta be committed. I mean, I shoot videos almost every day. I mean, like I'm already suited up because I got my other kind of TV traditional obligations and I gotta be ready for any kind of breaking news. But like literally, I mean, I gotta shoot like a TikTok or two every day or like a podcast or whatever they want. If we're talking about something old true crime, that's what's trending, then we gotta be on it. If it's just tips, if it's just trends, if it's just funny stuff around the office, you gotta have that team that understands it. And basically, and the joke is, I always say, I just work here. I'm literally working for them. They know social media. That's why I brought them in. Don't resist what they're saying and do what they say. So they're there. They shoot the videos. They got the scripts. They tell me what to do. Obviously, I check it to make sure it's accurate. You don't want to give people incorrect legal tips. So make sure you kind of do your work. But ultimately, they're the ones that are saying, listen, people want to know about this, right? Whatever's like, you know, trending in the news or legal questions. So you know, we'll do a 20, 30, 30 second TikTok and we go from there. So is it like a, you know, a copywriter, a video person, an editor, a researcher, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you gotta have your copywriter and videographer for sure. You know, a videographer might be able to do some editing. Copywriting is important because again, the words that come out of your mouth, I mean, whether it's spoken or the text bubbles, that's super important, especially for something like TikTok. You wanna make sure it's, Look, lawyers, you can tell from this podcast, oh, we like to talk. You know, some of us seemingly get paid by the word, but people don't want that on TikTok. They want it short. They want it concise. Otherwise, guess what? If, you know, they're going to swipe and they're going to the next video. So you definitely need, need that team. So within the social media team, we got, uh, we got videographer, we got copywriter, we got obviously social media manager. We got someone that just literally goes in and responds to all the DMs and comments. I mean, that's a lot of work. You got to be engaged, you know. You can't be doing all this and then letting all the responses go into a black hole. So you need a lot of people if you really want to make a strong social media push. I, I couldn't agree more. And like that's the next push for myself is that community manager. That person just goes and engages because like we spend so much time creating this great content. And then it's like, OK, on to the next piece of content when the key to showing up in their algorithm is, is the engagement is, is the likes. No, oh, absolutely. I, I kind of want to talk about a little bit about how your firms evolved, right? Because your case intakes increased, the number of staffs increased. At what point did you get a dedicated HR recruiter? You know, at what point do you think it's necessary for a firm? Yeah, we started doing, uh, you know, we kind of had an office manager, type HR person, but ultimately it was a few years ago, it was before the pandemic, we just got too big. We're up to like 25 lawyers and 100 staff. And so now you gotta have like a dedicated finance team, CFO, controller, like HR chief people officer. So now we have, I mean, ultimately, you know, in the beginning when you start your firm, you're probably doing everything. When I say you as a lawyer, you're probably running payroll, you're dealing with HR issues, but ultimately, I mean, you just can't, you know? I mean, I used to respond to like all the social media stuff myself, you know, I mean, it wasn't that many, but it's just going to become too big at some point. You know, even, even when you would like schedule me, you just kind of contact me directly. Now I have to have an executive assistant. She's handling everything. Thank God. God bless her. So sometimes you're just going to be too big. You got to, you got to staff up and manage the team. Otherwise you're not going to be able to scale and grow like you need to. So you were, you were, you know, that tip of the, uh, the spear for the Dunbar's number. I think Dunbar's number is from 50 to 150. So uh, first of all, I applaud you for that. And that, that speaks to you like being personable and having a good culture kind of naturally, 
you know, the, the other thing that just, just personally me sharing Nima is what I found is like, those were for, for me were difficult because of those non-revenue generating employees, right? They start to hit your margins. But what I found was like, oh my gosh, it's just accelerated our growth so much more. And I wish I would have even done it earlier. Yeah, that should make your life easier. Removes you from some of those, you know, like HR decisions. It can really kind of bog you down. You know, in terms of conducting interviews, someone that you trust just to like screen through people that just aren't going to be a good fit. I mean, it's ultimately, right? We're in the service industry and your time and my time is valuable, right? So to the extent that you're spending time on things that's what's, and again, I say it respectfully, someone else could be doing, that's a bad business decision. And you got to spend time on what you like to do, you know, where you have passion or where you can have the most impact, I guess, you know, because especially yourself, you're, you have the highest hourly rate, like everyone has an hourly rate. And, and that's just, that's just true for all of us. And, you know, one, one of the other things too, I like to talk about as well as it, you know, we talk about marketing, but, but it's, it's sales, it's intake. So, you know, just general philosophies here, you know, are you, you know, in-house intake? Are you, you know, dedicated intake team? Are you having the attorneys do intake? I've heard, you know, Anna Jar Levine, very large firm in Florida, they do all their intake by attorneys and I, and you know, others, you know, Gary Falkowitz is saying, Hey, dedicated intake specialists, you know, where do you sit on the intake side of things? We have intake specialists, but they're our most senior staff because the last thing you want to do is run these amazing campaigns and you have, you know, people that don't know how to talk to clients. You know, obviously the first time they're calling a law firm, you know, they're scared, they're upset. If you don't have the people that can ask the right questions and to deal with these potential clients, you're going to lose them to the other firm. There's a hundred other firms out there they can call. So when we put our top staff as the front line, right? As soon as even a reception calls a potential client, it goes to our dedicated intake team. But on top of that, we have dedicated intake attorneys. That is all they do. So they are there and, you know, like for instance, Leon is one of them. I mean, you mentioned her uh, before the show. She's fantastic. She does a lot of our TikToks. She's the most senior attorney on our intake team and she manages everyone and she's great. She's personable, she's likable, and she makes sure that we don't lose a potential client to another firm. And then on top of it, because the intake attorneys can't be on call 24 seven, we have an on-call system. And this is something I picked up when I was a government attorney. So if you're at the US Attorney's Office, DOJ, guess what? You're gonna be on call once, maybe twice a month. You gotta pick up the phone. So for the government, FBI would call and say, we arrested this person or we want to get this search warrant. The attorney has to make a decision. So we have an on-call system here at the firm. we got to take call. Obviously, we work around people's schedules because, look, it can be 24 hours a day. Call center may call and you got to make a decision, yay or nay, while the potential client's on the phone with limited information, whether you want to take the case, refer it out or reject it. So that's kind of how we do it. And we want to make sure that we cover it all and we don't lose any leads you're on the cutting edge, right? So you're doing the Google, uh, Google screen, the local service ads, and that's, you rank by region response and review. And I, and I, we talked to a lot of prospects and they're like, well, I'm not showing up in Google screened and I'll go check out their call rail. And I see a bunch of missed calls or I see it go into an outsourced intake team. And it's like, that's because your response isn't good enough. Google wants to send it to someone else. Yeah. Uh, if I see call rail and I see a missed call, I mean, like, you know, you're going to see smoke coming out of my ears. I mean, that's the worst thing that an attorney can do. You're breaking your back, your marketing, your digital team to get these leads. And if your intake team is dropping the ball, I mean, that's those leads cost thousands of dollars, you know, of the good ones, at least. I mean, we, we know that we know how much a good opportunity is. So, I mean, that would never happen. So you got to build that robust intake team to take your calls. Otherwise, your marketing skills are for naught. So, and I wanted to kind of comment on one of the things you said on our last interview. You said, you know, you've learned that that not all calls are created equal, not all leads are created equal, and the kind of focus on the quality and being the initial call is that important, opposed to chasing, you know, recycled leads. So explain what do you mean by that? Are, are you referring to like lead gen companies where, you know, they're, they're sourcing out a bunch of leads or eighth position <laughs> yeah i mean, obviously lead gen companies those those tend to be bad right because anyway i mean we, we can kind of have a whole show about that but look even uh you know google ads right you got to be that first call you know and, and the difference between what we do and what most people do is well, if you're doing e-commerce man you know someone's clicking around you're the fifth site and you know they make a transaction you close the deal great you know you close the deal but for us if you're the fifth click 
or the fifth cause case that's been rejected by four of the firms. So in my book I wrote, it's like, it's like Ricky Bobby, you know, Talladega Nights. If you're not first in PI, you're last. So you're going to be better off spending money to get to that first position. Make sure you're first call because, look, you're getting calls, but, you know, potential clients are working down the list. That's a case that's been rejected by other firms. That's not something that you want. That also, you know, speaks to your marketing with your Google ads, with what you're bidding and, and also your SEO strategy to show up ranking number one. Because, you know, a lot of people complain. They're like, oh, I'm not getting great calls from SEO. And I look and I'm like, well, you're ranking sixth. You know, the person that's getting the good calls are in the one, two and three position. The other thing that just briefly before I want to jump to a couple final questions here, Nima, is Google ads. So you mentioned it. And from what I've seen, we work with about 44, 45 PI firms. They're in the, you know top of seven figures, mini eight, and then a few nine figure firms. And being transparent, I haven't seen personal injury work very well for, from a Google ads perspective. Are they looking at it wrong? You know, not the long play from like a referral standpoint and the reviews or, or is it come down to intake? You know, what do you see from the Google ads perspective? Obviously, Every year, the clicks keep increasing. And well, what I say is, you know, SEO is like dating, you know, and lawyers want it right away. I mean, Google ads are like, you know, prostitution, you know, so it's great. Yeah, you, you get that quick fix. Obviously, the ideal way to do things is to rank in the organic, right? That's always going to be better quality. Those are our potential clients that, you know, have spent some time on your site. They've gotten some information and they're ready to actually pick up the phone and call. And once they do, they're ready to become clients. Whereas like how much information is in the Google ad copy in that text, you know? You don't know if it's necessarily relevant. You don't know if the person is going to be a good potential client, but you're getting that immediate influx of calls. It might not be the best quality, but you're getting the calls. So like my, what I would encourage everyone to do, if you can remain patient and you can do it right, you got to do SEO. I mean, that's just the best way to be successful over the long term. I'm a huge omni-channel advocate. I think all marketing works. Uh, it, it's attention arbitrage. Some channels work better than others. It all kind of factors into your CAC, your cost of uh, client acquisition, cost to acquire a client, and and how that plays into you know lifetime value. And you know, so do you still see Google ads though? You know, because when I'm looking, I'm looking like 500, 600 dollars a click. You know, California is more expensive than say, you know, Oklahoma. You still see the numbers that make it worthwhile. Look, it's changing over time, right? Originally, you just had your Google ads, right? Then GMB came in, right? Everyone's going from desktop to mobile, so that becomes a lot more important. I got local service ads that are coming in, so. It's constantly shifting over time. I would say Google ads are becoming less important because people are becoming more sophisticated because of GMB, because of LSA. But I still think you got to do it all. Obviously, look, in an ideal world, you're showing up at all three LSA, Google ads, and GMB, and you got some sort of organic listing, at least on the first page. I mean, the client's going to think, or potential client, you're everywhere. I mean, that's really what you want to be. I don't care if it's retargeting. I don't care if it's billboards. TV. Ultimately, the reason why this is important is this. And again, I kind of compared e-commerce to PI, but let me just compare PI to other areas of the law. When clients hire a PI firm, they're not paying anything up front. Most of the firms charge the same amount, right? Your 33% or 40%. So they're going to hire the firm that they think is the biggest, the baddest, and the best, right? Because they're not paying anything out of pocket. It's not like criminal where you got to get a retainer. There's no negotiation really. And they're ready to close the deal. So you got to be big and the client's got to think that you're the biggest and the best. So that kind of omni strategy that you're talking about is what closes as opposed to them thinking you're one man or one woman show. That's such a great piece of advice. And and they see you're, you, you're building that digital brand. They see you, they may not click in the Google ads, but they see you again in the maps and they recognize you in the, in the ads. And then they see in the organic, they're like, well, I need to click on this individually. And it's a perception thing that you're perceived as the best in those positions. You know, a couple final questions here, Nima. There's so much talk about vision. You know, do you have a vivid vision, Cameron Harold? And, you know, what does the vision look like? What are you striving for for your firm and your business? Like, what's the big picture? Have you set that? Or are you still looking more to kind of like the short term 
approach for the firm. Yeah, I mean, I kind of have a different story because I never thought I was going to do PI, right? You know, I was big law, I was a prosecutor, I was being vetted for the bench, I was going to be a judge. And then it turned out we had a, had a couple of kids and my wife was also an attorney, she represents foster kids. We just couldn't afford it. So I kind of backed into PI because my partner got into it, but I didn't really hold it in a high regard. I thought like, look, these are people that really are just in it to make money. Um, they don't necessarily care about the practice of law. So on one hand, I'm not trying to sell myself. I really want to kind of do things right and change the perception of PI lawyers. We have the worst perception as far as lawyers out there. People already don't like lawyers, PI lawyers. So, you know, that's why I kind of do, you know, the traditional legal analyst stuff. It's like, okay, this guy's a PI lawyer, but he's on Fox or CNN or whatever kind of news channel you like, right? To kind of raise the stature of PI lawyers. That's one. I want to provide good service. But the thing about just the law in general, it can be a miserable place to work, you know? You know, people, law students aren't happy, lawyers aren't happy. So what I like to do is bring in cool people. I'm mean, obviously, I like you, I like talking to you, but I want people that I go to work and I see and I'm happy because you're gonna spend more time with your coworkers and your colleagues than you do your own family. So we try to make it a fun place to work. That's why even though I do the serious stuff and breaking news, we do all sorts of funny trends on TikTok because look, man, these are my friends. I want to work with them and I want this to be a fun place to work. So, you know, ultimately growth um, is something that's going to happen when you surround yourself with good people and they're loyal and you work hard. And, you know, we've kind of been blessed, but, but really that's my vision. Kind of a work hard, play hard, fun place to work. Yeah, and I, I think that's what it's all about, right? So when Monday rolls around, you're good. You're going in. You're getting to hang out with people you enjoy hanging out with instead of just dreading you know, going into work. What's next for West Coast Trial Lawyers and for the firm? Yeah, so, I mean, we're doing really well here in California. I think it's time for us to kind of take that next step. We're going to start going to some other states. Probably Nevada would be next, then maybe Arizona and Washington, kind of expand that reach. So next time we talk, we may have uh, some offices. I might be in Vegas or some other city. So what we're going to take this show on the road. The law might not be sexy, but it can be entertaining. Understand the audience you look to capture on each platform and create specific content for each one. When you hire the right people for social, trust your team and do what they say, even if that means being ready for multiple TikToks a day. As the call volume increases, invest in intake. Not all calls are created equal, but if your intake team isn't there to intercept them, then your marketing dollars go to waste. I'd like to thank Nima Romani from West Coast Trial Lawyers for sharing his story with us, and I hope you gained some valuable insights from the conversation. To hear more about how his firm tackles intake, check out episode 33 of Lawher with Sonia Palmer, VP of Operations at Rankings. You've been listening to Personal Injury Mastermind. I'm Chris Dreyer. If you like this episode, leave us a review. We love to hear from our listeners. I'll catch you on next week's PIM with another incredible guest and all the strategies you need to master personal injury marketing. Personal injury marketing.